What did God mean when he told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply? When God told Adam and Eve to have children and multiply, he had just finished creating everything, which culminated in the creation of his masterpieces, the very first man and woman. Genesis 1 verse 28, Amplified Bible, And God blessed them, granting them certain authority, and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subjugate it, putting it under your power, and rule over, dominate, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and everything that moves upon the earth. You see, the system of fruitfulness is tied to the word fruit, and we see what God did in verse 11 of Genesis. The third day's activity focused on the formation of the dry land and the sea, as well as the process of making the earth productive. Previously, the power of the Creator had been exercised and employed around the upper part of the visible world. The light of heaven was kindled, and the firmament of heaven was fixed. However, now that He has descended to this lower world, the earth, which was designed for the children of men, designed for both their habitation and for their maintenance, the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself. The plants were brought into existence not as seeds, but as fully developed plants, each of which produced seeds. They were thus created as mature plants, having the appearance of age. The chicken really did come before the egg. Man was created from the earth, and just like the vegetation, man was also created in a mature form, having the appearance of age. God endowed his creation with an innate capacity for reproduction as well as the desire to have offspring. God reiterated this instruction to Noah. After the flood had submerged the entire planet, the Lord said to Noah, his sons, and the sons of his sons. Genesis 9 verse 7, Amplified Bible. As for you, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. In both these instances, the Lord gave the injunction for mankind to increase their population by having and raising children. Now that the world had days and nights, seasons and years, plants and animals, Adam and Eve, and other living things, God set into motion His plan to populate the world that He had just finished creating with people. Isaiah 45 verse 18, Amplified Bible for the Lord who created the heavens, he is God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it to be a wasteland, but formed it to be inhabited, says this, I am the Lord and there is no one else. As stated at the beginning of Genesis 1 verse 28, it was God's blessing for Adam and Eve to have children and work the earth. The world was Adam and Eve's inheritance and they were charged with the responsibility of populating it. Commentator Matthew Henry wrote that God blessed the first couple with a numerous lasting family to enjoy this inheritance, in virtue of which their posterity should extend to the utmost corners of the earth and continue to the utmost period of time. To put it another way, God wished for Adam and Eve to have many children, and he also wanted their children to have many children. But fruitfulness can also refer to a great many other things. It was never God's plan for Adam and Eve to simply produce offspring for the sake of doing so. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion. In addition, God assigns responsibilities to man, one of which is to carry out his will regarding the exercise of dominion over the earth. The idea that man should have children spread out across the land and populate it, is completely implicit in this command. If the earth is not populated, then man will never be able to fulfill God's plan for him on this planet. Additionally, God gave mankind a desire for sex, which should make populating the earth quick and likely. Many people, however, have mistakenly believed that the sole or primary purpose that God had for sex was for humans to be fruitful and multiply. This is not the case. God's primary intention when he created sex 
was for it to play a role in the formation of a one-flesh relationship. Animals engage in sexual behavior solely for the purpose of procreation, whereas the sexual responses of humans and animals are strikingly dissimilar in a number of ways. For example, humans engage in sexual sex in private. Only humans continue to have intercourse after the end of fertility, making humans the only species to do so. None of these uniquely human aspects of sex are necessary for reproduction, but they are all beneficial as a tool for bonding. Genesis 9 verse 3 Amplified Bible Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I give you everything as I give you the green plants and vegetables. In the remainder of Genesis 1 verse 28, we see a useful and desired result to fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Was the command to be fruitful and multiply that was given to Adam and Eve as a blessing also intended for us to follow today? Some take this view and believe that we are just meant to fill the earth without planning. But if Genesis 1 verse 28 was a blessing upon mankind in general, we see this when looking to the New Testament. First, during his 33 years of ministry on earth, Jesus did not have a wife or any children of his own. As a Jew, Jesus was brought up in accordance with the rules and traditions of Judaism, and he perfectly satisfies the requirements of God's law. Galatians 4 verse 4 But when in God's plan the proper time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the regulations of the law. Matthew 5 verse 17 Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. However, Jesus did not physically bear fruit, and neither did he multiply, which indicates that the command found in Genesis 1 verse 28 is not one that every person is obligated to follow. Along with this, Jesus said that virginity is a personal choice, neither condemning it nor praising it above marriage and childbearing. Matthew 19 verse 12, Amplified Bible, For there are eunuchs who have been born that way from their mother's womb, making them incapable of consummating a marriage. And there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men for royal service. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves so for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. Second, the Apostle Paul exhorts Christians that it is better to stay single than be married, that it is so that they can devote their full attention to serving God. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 38 So then both the father who gives his virgin daughter in marriage does well, and he who does not give her in marriage will do better. 1 Corinthians 7 verses 32 to 35 But I want you to be free from concern. The unmarried man is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But the married man is concerned about worldly things, how he may please his wife, and his interests are divided. The unmarried woman or the virgin is concerned about the matters of the Lord, how to be holy and set apart both in body and in spirit. But a married woman is concerned about worldly things, how she may please her husband. Now I say this for your own benefit, not to restrict you, but to promote what is appropriate and secure, undistracted devotion to the Lord. Paul asserts that there are scenarios in which being single is preferable to being married, despite the fact that he acknowledges that marriage is a positive thing overall. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle would not encourage us against bearing fruit and multiplying if that were one of God's direct commands. Whether or not we choose to have children, we are still able to live lives that are pleasing to God and that bring Him glory. When we obey Jesus' command to go and make disciples of all nations, we have the opportunity to be spiritually fruitful and to increase the number of people who are citizens of the Kingdom of God. Matthew 28 verses 16 to 19 Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, 
but they doubted that it was really he. Jesus came up and said to them, All authority, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Help the people to learn of me, believe in me, and obey my words, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The directive to have and raise offspring to occupy the earth was a part of God's plan. This is a truly amazing invitation to participate alongside Him in the act of creation. However, the responsibility does not disappear after that point. It is the responsibility of parents to instill a love of the Lord in their children and to teach them to follow His counsel and instruction. We see how the Word of God makes it clear that Abraham would raise his children in the way of the Lord. We also read in Ephesians 6 verse 4, Amplified Bible, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate them to the point of resentment with demands that are trivial or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive, nor by showing favoritism or indifference to any of them, but bring them up tenderly with loving kindness in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Being a parent is a chance to participate in God's plan for humanity in a unique way that can leave an influence for generations. The conclusion that God came to after completing His work of creation was that it was very good. God was pleased with His creation, and so are we. When God pronounced the creation good, He really meant it. At the time, it was entirely good. There was no death or decay on earth at all.